Great. Well, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to Digital Innovations Weekend 3.0 on planetary sensing. Welcome to those of you here at Central St. Martins and the, those of you online on the internet. It's my pleasure to introduce Joanna Vrinska, London-based writer, lecturer, artist, and curator. She's professor of media philosophy and critical digital practice in the Department of Digital Humanities at King's College London and a member of Creative AI Lab, a collaboration between King's and Serpentine Galleries. She works in the areas of digital technologies and new media, ethics, photography, and art. She's the author of nine books, many of which are accessible online. Uh, most recently in 2023, The Perception Machine, our photographic future between the eye and AI, exploring the future of photography and human perception in the age of AI. Her other publications include AI Art, Machine Visions and Warped Dreams, Perception at the End of the World, or How Not to Play Video Games, The End of Man, A Feminist Counter-Apocalypse, Non-Human Photography, Minimal Ethics for the Anthropocene, Life After New Media, Mediation as a Vital Process, Bioethics in the Age of New Media, The Ethics of Cultural Studies, and on spiders, cyborgs, and being sacred. Scared, not sacred. On spiders, cyborgs, and being scared, <laughs> the feminine and the sublime, very important. <laughs> Her writing has been translated into Chinese, Czech, Korean, French, German, Italian, Norwegian, Polish, Portuguese, Russian, Spanish, and Turkish. And she recently co-edited Photo Mediations, an open book, and Photo Mediations, a reader, as part of Europeana Space a grant funded by the European Union's ICT Policy Support Program. And she's currently researching perception and cognition as boundary zones between human and machine intelligence, while also trying to answer the question, does photography have a future? She combines her philosophical writings with image-based art practice and curatorial work, and within her art practice, she experiments with different kinds of image-based media. She's currently researching perception and cognition, as boundary zones between human and machine intelligence. So today, Joanna will be talking through her art projects, exploring the end of man, non-human photography, the automation of global labor, and feminist drones. And she works through a performative method across planetary scales. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Joanna Zelinska. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for having me here. Um, so uh, uh, let's start from uh, this opening image. I'm going to talk to you about planetarity, which is like ways of engaging with the planet as a problem. The planet, specifically planet Earth, is looking quite enfeebled here. And I'm interested in images of our planet in all its vulnerability due to the climate crisis, the Anthropocene, the sixth extinction, but I'm also interested in the planetary scale of images, especially mechanically produced images such as photographs, synthetic images resembling photographs. But let's open this image to a wider context uh, to explain why we are talking about planetarity and planetary sensing today and in the whole series of your talks I understand you're having on planetary sensing. So today we're increasingly being interpolated to recognize ourselves as planetary beings. Yet we also have to counter with the fact that, as Dipesh Chakravorty puts it, the planet remains profoundly indifferent to our existence. So my work engages with planetary concerns, but it's not itself produced from a planetary perspective, with the producer's eye lodged high in the sky. Instead, I'm kind of making my work in medias res, in the middle of things, amidst the matter of media, the pile of piles of techno rubbish, the threat of organic and non-organic viruses. So driven by an awareness of the fact that the planet doesn't indeed care, I posit that this lack of care shouldn't be mutual. And on the contrary, that we need to exercise some kind of responsibility for our planet and the modes of its inhabitation. And this is what I'm trying to kind of uh, enact in my uh, theoretical and artistic work. So the talk presents my method for conducting artistic research, uh, which also in, it contains an epistemic proposition while being driven by an ethical injunction. And this injunction is shaped by a number of um, responsibilities, 
are exerted not only by humans towards one another, but also both by non-human beings. Well, the planet itself uh, as our habitation partner and uh, life source. But maybe I should provide a little bit of background of where I'm coming from with all this. Um, so uh, this is like a map of my head, probably, uh, while also showing a number of projects. Um, so I'm currently working at King's uh, as, and, and my job title probably names quite well what I'm doing. Uh, so I'm doing both media philosophy or philosophy of technology, but I also have an art practice. And sometimes these things, well, most often these things work together. So I'm trying to do philosophy with art, through art, not just about art. And I'm also trying to develop a way of thinking with images, thinking with uh, practice, but also a way of producing. So art is not an illustration of a worked out theory. I'm trying to have a way, different ways of thinking and sensing the world through different media. Uh, so but prior to joining King's, I, I worked at Goldsmiths for uh, 15, 17 years. So many of you will know the Goldsmiths has quite an art ethos and uh, anything goes, you could put things together into different configurations. Um, uh, originally, I trained in, in kind of literature and philosophy. And uh, then I kind of went to do an art degree and a kind of photography, art photography degree, uh, which um, is a master's program, which kind of changed the way I was philosophizing, I was writing, it changed everything. And I originally thought I would keep things separate, but it didn't kind of work. So like many of us coming from different backgrounds, different disciplines, I'm a kind of academic artistic hybrid. And my talk today will consist of two parts. The first will be a guided tour of kind of a number of projects I've been involved in and uh, in which this method will be outlined. And the second one will zoom in on a particular project trying to enact a planetary practice with a difference. And through that, I will introduce a recent book of mine called The Perception Machine and a project contained within called uh, Feminist with a Drone. Uh, designed as a kind of cr creative critical attempt to perform planetarity on a micro scale. So my overall aim today is to demonstrate the way in which my work responds to and forecasts some kind of different futures beyond the doom and gloom of contemporary kind of horizons and, and the issues of the present moment. Um, so I'm kind of, on the one hand, I'm interested in outlining a certain ethical horizon. On the other hand, I'm also keen to uh, keep a check on uh, certain bombastic artistic pronouncements about how art, art, art is going to change the world and intervene. So it's just somewhat balanced. I mean, I think it does make sense to make art, <laughs> but for a variety of reasons, but I'm trying to, you could describe all sorts of interventions I make, which I indeed do myself, with a kind of term minimal. So it's kind of minimal approach towards planetarity, Z kind of zigzagging across scales to try and say, do and make something. Okay, so how all does all of this play out? Now, given the complexity and scale of the environmental crisis manifesting itself in the rising sea levels, accelerated species extinction, and a climate shift, it's understandable why planetarity is playing an increasingly prominent role in the arts, humanities, social sciences today. Positioned as a concept that can help us understand these changes, it has recently been used as a call to responsibility and action. For example, in the 2020 special issue of the kind of art journal EFLAX, You and I Don't Live on the Same Planet, edited by Martin Ginnard, Bruno Latour and colleagues, or as a framing device in these books that you've got here on the slide, Planetary Social Thought, or the climate in the history of a planetary age. And it's within the framework of the recently postulated epoch of the Anthropocene, an epoch of which the human is set to have become a geological agent, uh, ge agent truly being able to change the layers of, uh, of the planet and leave a geological trace, that planetary thinking has most often been outlined. Now, many of the thinkers, writers, uh, artists, engaging with the concept of planetarity are doing it in a conversation with this particular book by post-colonial writer Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak. 
especially the, the final chapter, the book is called um, Death of a Discipline, the discipline being compar you know, comparative literature, it's talking about comparative literature studies in the US especially. The book came out in 2002, but it has a very kind of timely chapter. It's a tiny book with a tiny chapter, so very much in line with this my spirit of, kind of minimal interventions that try to make a significant difference. Uh, so, Spivak says that the planet is in this species of alterity, belonging to another system, and yet we inhabit it on loan. Uh, and Spivak is opposed to the abstraction of globalization, which she saw, sees as the imposition of the same system of exchange everywhere. And so, uh, she says the globe is on our computers. No one lives there. It allows us to think that we can aim to control it, but the planet lives in the space, in the space of difference. So kind of moving from globalization to planetarity. And you can say that a lot of people are repeating that shift today with their work, with their thinking. Now this planetary perspective for Spivak is paradoxically, yet importantly, always partial always fragmented. Introducing the sense of the uncanny is also presented as a demand and a call to responsibility. Now, how is this responsibility to be engaged? Who is its addressee, subject, and is the subject always human? These questions call for an in-depth examination of the very constitution of the human as a species and a subject, historical subject. But I want to suggest that if, again, this human is to exercise meaningful responsibility and not just aesthetic sensibility, a planetary perspective in artistic research needs to be anchored in the socio-political concerns of the here and now, primarily the ecological and economic crises, also the gendering and uh, racialization of the apocalyptic narratives brought in response to these crises, and all the kind of bigger sociopolitical issues concerning the AI or the future of us after AI. So as well as looking into human and non-human past, we need to look into the future of the human and the human habitats. And for this human to have a future, its timeline needs to be considered and experienced together with the demands of non-humans from animals through to mycelium, incense, and insects, plants, and rocks. So I'm gonna show you the uh, little uh, film, Exit Man, which was an attempt to enact this response and responsibility in a different medium. And here we have silences and talk robots. The belief in seeming... I'm sorry, it's so sensitive here. I'm trying to... If I could get some technical help, that would be fantastic. Just having some problems working with the trackpad. I'm just trying to. Okay, yeah, I just. Okay. Yeah, I just muted the. Okay, so. Um, Uh, so that was a film kind of called Exit Man. It's an attempt to enact this response and responsibility in a different medium. And um, well, this film is kind of accompanying a book as well. So I very often I write and I make things and they are part of the same spectrum, conceptual spectrum. So it's a photo film, so I was channeling my inner Chris Marker, not for the last time, uh, or first indeed. Uh, so it's a little book called The End of Man, A Feminist Counter Apocalypse, and it's part of that book that is also a film. And you can find different entry points. You can start from the film, get to the book, you can just stay with the film, you can stay with the book. So they are kind of complementary. So I'm trying to kind of address how art can face planetary concerns and articulate them through different media. The media I use involve still and moving images, photography, post-photography, sound, speculative design, and AI. In, discipl in disciplinary terms, I take what could be called like a creative for post-humanities perspective, um, bringing together environmental humanities and critical post-humanism, 
querying the human, the non-human, and you know, our, the space in which we live, which is our planet. The method of that brings together you know, media arts, speculative design, philosophy, digital humanities. What it takes from digital humanities is especially this push to move beyond the text, to embrace images, data, algorithms, and visualizations as not only things to study, but also things to make knowledge with. So often when I take talk to you know, philosophers, writers, I have to persuade people that you know, it, it's possible to think and philosophize with other media. But also when I talk to artists, I have to say that don't be afraid of language, because language is just another medium. So lots of people are very good with steel, with wood, with a piece of cloth, with algorithms. So, but they are somehow really scared. And when I work with artists and I supervise students who are artists, they are happy to go and experiment with so many different media. But when it comes to writing, there's a moment of panic. I'm thinking, well, it's just another medium. If you, you want to play, you want to engage with different modalities of media, and you already have so many under your belt, have a go. Try and see what you can do with language, what language can do with you and to you. So don't think of it as this other, this thing that you know, only people who think and write and have different skills do it. I mean, you can do it. It's yours to go and play with and twist and bend and exercise things over. And that's kind of, uh, and that's my own zigzagging method as well. In my own work, so as well as a kind of hacking at language, you could say, from different directions with a view to trying to say something, uh, images are important to me. But I'm also trying to explore the, the question posed by uh, Lev Manovich, uh, how can you see one billion images? And I also accompany that question with another one. What happens if the seer and the image maker are no longer human today? So when I talk a little bit about non-human images and this project called Non-Human Photography, which I did a few years ago, again, it was a book and it contained a, lot, a number of different projects. Um, so non-human photography referred to photographs that were not of, um, for, or by the human uh, land, depopulated landscapes, um, you know, photography taken with endoscopy equipment or satellites, cameras, QR codes. So realizing that, you know, human to human photography taken with your phone or with some older devices, just a small part of the production of images. Um, so the project, what I did for this, it contained uh, a website as well. But also there was a little museum of non-human photography which I've constructed in very simple terms. Uh, and I'm trying to kind of think how a book opens up onto other media to present this panorama of different ways of living with images. I'm going to show you the project that also is kind of at the heart of the book called Active Perceptual System. And it, the, the term comes from Donna Haraway, but it's kind of become a think timely now again that, you know, computer vision is so being so hyped today. And uh, so for two years, um, I was wearing this little device here that you can see called an autographer. It was originally de designed as a, a device for Alzheimer's patients as a kind of uh, mnemonic device. You would wear it and remember things, but it didn't sell enough. So it was rebranded as a gadget for the always on generation. So, um, so I wore it and that was a few years ago and it looked like a necklace. Uh, the camera would take pictures automatically um, uh, at different intervals. I wore it for two years to different places, to, you know, to a, you know, artist talks for a walk in a theater, in a restaurant. And I was just trying, and then I ended up, and obviously I didn't wear it all the time, but I ended up with like 16,000 images. And I was trying to edit them into something meaningful to a human, meaningful to myself, while also reflect on that overproduction of images and what was happening there. And um, realizing that we were all living, and the images um, were kind of, uh, this is, you're having a kind of short edit, so, of the images I got. And what was interesting for me with this whole experiment, that it was me and not me taking the picture, because it was my body. So the body activated the camera, but I wasn't quite sure how or when, because there wasn't a button. 
and it was just the camera decided, which of course it didn't decide as such, but at some point it was triggered, it was doing something. It was also this kind of slightly different view, you know, breaking with perspective. Again, you know, all the kind of art school kids we are told to at some point start, you know, breaking away from perspectival vision and try and see differently. So I was just trying to see what it means to see with my body. But obviously there was also something quite um, uh, spooky and, and, and worrying about this, having this camera, you know, sitting here over dinner with a friend, going to a bar and being in a photographer's gallery in London here actually on the stairs and uh, in the bathroom uh, and capturing those moments. And obviously that experience is not that different to us anyway because we're being photographed constantly with cameras, big and small, in so many different situations. So I tried maybe to take the gaze back it was a one-off project, but I also was trying to kind of reflect on Willem Flusser's idea that a photographer today is first of all an editor, or an image maker is an editor, because images are already around us. So Flusser has called a photographer an informer. So informer, not really one who informs, but one who gives form to things, so creates information, provides form or structure to the imagistic flow after the images have been taken. So Flusser's point brings me to the problem of creativity as enacted by human and machine intelligence. How can we still you know, make images, take images? Who from, in what way? Is there any point? So um, I'm gonna show you another project of mine, which is related to uh, another little book uh, AI art, machine visions and warped dreams, in which I went to offend a lot of people uh, who were producing terrible things in the name of AI. So uh, it's the, the idea of the book was not to say that AI was terrible, because uh, I have a great fascination with interest in the technology, the potentiality, but obviously recognizing the limitations, the dangers, biases, the problems, but also to raise some questions around what kind of art got hyped and um, the, the kind of broad, highlight broader socio-political issues. So as part of the book, I did this project called View from the Window, which was an attempt to investigate problems of labor. So um, I was trying to, for that book, I commissioned for, for that book within a book, which was an e-book, I was trying to think about the question of labor. Who was working uh, behind the scenes to make, to give us the beautiful world of AI? And I commissioned on the platform, you know, Amazon Mechanical Turk, which is a platform that Amazon, it's like a digital marketplace where you can go and hire people really cheaply to give them tasks to label images. Uh, that's how actually ImageNet, one of the first kind of big databases of images that trained AI, machine learning. Uh, so you can get people to do surveys, you can get people to do all sorts of things, and they are very mechanical tasks, tasks that would be too expensive to train a computer to do it. So you get humans to do them, and Amazon referred to it informally as artificial, artificial intelligence. So it's basically human AI. Uh, so I was trying to reflect on those conditions, and I tried to capture a picture. I gave people a task of please go and take a photo from a window, wherever you were. Uh, now, if you, there was no window in, your, in wherever you were, please uh, go to the next room in which there is a window and take a picture. And process, you know, self, uh, some kind of processing was okay, but it wasn't required. So I got here like a portrait, you could call it a portrait of global labor. Uh, people, these Amazon Turkers, who you only know through, um, uh, through their numbers. Um, I, the whole project, you know, I uh, asked people to uh, not spend longer than, you know, a minute or two on that. The project was priced quite competitively, so people kind of bought it uh, immediately, got these tasks immediately. Uh, dis they disappeared very, very quickly. But at the same time, obviously, the idea of using that just for the benefit of an art project is not unproblematic. And I was trying with that, with my own discomfort, to reflect on the idea of what it means for my own artistic or research pleasure to be using 
those kind of invisible bodies and minds and to bring them to that. So as part of that, I was also trying to study a lot of, uh, you know, what was happening, who was working on the platform. There was an article that was kind of putting, um, was showing, and I commissioned a hundred of these um, Turkers. Um, and we found out from an article that the majority of people working as M Turkers are in the USA. That was from 2018. I don't think it's changed very much. I was checking recently. Uh, then India was second, Canada, UK, Philippines, and Germany. Um, you don't know anything about these people, but you can gather from vegetation, from weather, from signs, you know, where that, how their distribution around the world. You can see that some people are working in the cars, other people are working in quite nice apartments, other people, you know, sitting with garden, in, you know, gardens in the background. You don't really tell very much. I mean, the, the whole picture still remains visible and invisible at the same time. You don't really learn very much. You're getting some kind of message, and yet. But the idea behind my project was to rematerialize this cloudy vapor behind the narrative of you know, AI, mechanical workers, by creating a group portrait of their peop those people's location. So it's a portraiture without faces. Uh, neither conventional portraiture nor conventional landscape photography, this collective view offers a non-comprehensive demographic snapshot of the global workforce looking out simulating the work of machines in its quiet efficiency, Amazon's empty work labor force ruptures the seamless narrative and visualization of the machinic world. It does this by bringing the material traces of human bodies and locations into the picture. The window, of course, is not just a rectangular visualization of the software interface patented by Microsoft, and used by other operating systems. The window here is also an actual metal or wooden frame, or the lack of it if people are stuck somewhere in basements or in other places. So, um, you know, and holding, so there is that kind of relationship between the in and the, the kind of out. The project offers a specific vantage point for perceiving the relationship between humans and technology at this particular moment in time, and recognizing that there is a vantage point, and then the view from nowhere promoted by most AI designers ends up putting a very specific white male, a historical human in the picture. So a broader goal of the work was to interrogate whose interests are being represented, who can afford to be creative for how long. And you know, now that after COVID, we have all become these mechanical Turks in Microsoft's or Zoom's digital factories, you know, slowly, including that whole of this event now is also kind of being distributed in that way. So we're all laboring for digital platforms as well as for kind of human bodies uh, and with human bodies. Um, we're kind of all working for these digital factories online. So the question about who can afford for how long, what it means for us, for creativity, for exhaustion, couldn't be more timely. And I then developed some of the threads from that work on AI, machine vision, and warped dreams in my latest project called The Perception Machine, our photographic future between the eye and an AI. And uh, shout out to the MIT Press and made the book available open access, so it's free to download as well as available to buy in, pa in, cop in paperback. So photography is very important to my planetary inquiry, as I mentioned, the reason being that today we are not only constantly photographing, but being photographed as well by machines of various dimensions and scales. And all these images are feeding um, machine learning databases used to generate new images. But we are also being constantly observed by human and mechanical eyes. So in the book, I suggested that we are today living in what could be described as the perception machine. Um, and there is something planetary or even cosmic about this idea of the perception, or of the perception machine, that there, it's like a globe or perhaps an eyeball, and this, you can see that reflected in the cover. Now here's a little optical task for you uh, in figuring out that perception machine. So the, what, what is the perception machine? Uh, it's obviously a metaphor for a number of different things. It's got a number of, of you know, com uh, connected layers. It describes the technical universe of images and their infrastructures, also a socio-political condition resulting from the automation of vision and imaging. But it also serves as a description of a large-scale universe of images, 
and imagination. Let me show you like another project that I did, which is Can machines see? Or does it mean for humans to endow machines with a capacity for seeing? And what does it mean to classify as seeing machines' ability to differentiate between objects on the basis? Okay, well, that's probably enough. <laughs> okay, so that was just a little. So the film is, I think, well, four minutes, five, five minutes long, kind of reanimates uh, images of brains and eyes taken from the Wellcome collection and, and re reproduced through a GAN algorithm, through a GAN model, and with the idea to kind of also offer a certain reflection on ways of seeing, ways, ways of perceiving things. And that kind of whole concept of what does it mean to see the world today? How humans see the world? How machines see the world? Do machines actually see the world at all? Is that a misnomer? And that's really what underpins a lot of my recent kind of work. So I'm going to show you this kind of last project. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on it. It's the project. Uh, it's an illustration of um, planetary sensing in the perception machine. And it's called Feminist with a Drone. So the project was presented in the field in the form of field notes that mobilizes drone technology currently used in so-called amazing drone Instagram stills and YouTube videos uh, from beautiful locations in the in the world, shot usually with GoPro Hero cameras, and there's loads of these videos on on, on uh, and a pro project like like this online. And they're showing this kind of beauty. They're showing what I described earlier as non-human photography. It's a beautiful world in a conventional sense. So totally depopulated. And sometimes there are little humans, but they look like action figures. Uh, so what I wanted to do was enact a less masterful and less heroic viewpoint, one that is more aware of its own technological entanglement. So as part of the project, I pr uh, produced uh, ethnographic, mock ethnographic notes. So the project is kind of being shown as these notes. I'm going to read to you because I'm going to explain. So the project took place in the winter of 2020-21. On the 12th of December 2020, I purchased a Rice Tello drone. Designed by the industry giant DJI, this mini drone marketed as the most fun drone ever is aimed at teaching kids and adults how awesome flying can be. The exploration of this awesomeness was the key goal of my field work. My first outing with the Tello took place on the 24th of December 2020 in a small park in a residential area of southwest London. During the flight times of up to 13 minutes, I captured a sequence of still and moving images from the height of between 2 and 10 meters. The experiment came to a halt when the drone flew away on descent. The follow-up search didn't yield any results. The situation compounded by unpropitious weather conditions and approaching dusk with a drone then considered lost. The following day, the drone was located in a different part of the park. The experiment in testing the drone's awesomeness was resu resumed the following week. Some images were taken during the first flight. On its second ascent, the drone lost one of its propellers, with the propeller itself becoming lost among the park's vegetation. A replacement propeller was installed, by this, but this made the drone inoperative with a device losing the capacity to fully lift off the ground. This concluded my attempt to fly the drone and take images with it. Loss was a key characteristic of my experience with the Rise Tello. Now, could things have gone any worse? Was the fieldwork conducted as part of my project a failure? Crucially, should I have bought a better, more manly and more high-tech drone? In the spirit of feminist bricolage, which is an approach that remains aware of power relations while foregrounding the practices of crafting, shaping, and producing that you know, scholars usually hide and hide behind in the production of beautiful surfaces, 
unpunctured by doubt and hesitation. It's a quote from Rachel Hansberg and Carol Taylor. They've proposed this kind of feminist bricolage. So I decided to repurpose my losses. The limited sample of images obtained from the drone's camera, and they are relatively low quality, coupled with the loss of the drone's functionality, led to the development of a hypothesis about the possibility of constructing an alternative visuality, which I termed loser images. Now, as a feminist response to the amazing drone views mentioned earlier, I offer loser images through this project and through like kind of lots of other ways of seeing, which I'll explain in a minute, as a figuration that channels some of the potential of the multi-perspectival, humachinic worldview without falling for the grandeur of scale. Figurations such as the cyborg, modest witness, or nomadic subject used in the work of feminist thinkers of technology, such as Donna Haraway or Rosie Bridotti, are thought devices aimed at shaping a different political imaginary or performing an alternative image of the future. Yet rather than propose a straightforward return to a more human or humane perspective in response to this domineering spatial and space vision, I wanted to probe further the creative potential of decoupling sight from a bipedal human body and dispersing it across the environment. So I was interested in mobilizing the cosmic and aerial image making technology to enact a less masterful, less domineering and less heroic way of visioning and Im imaging. So these ones were obviously taken with a drone, a huge kind of drone jumping around, baby drone, and I'll explain how I made these. But what I was trying to do as well, it's, I was channeling here as well the work of a you know, feminist geographer, Heather McLean, and who was praising chaotic research pathways. And I was very much on board with that project. So she was offering her chaotic methodology as a response to the planetary approach to the study of cities offered by various Marxist theorists. She recognized the value of that kind of big scale, big theory uh, from the top approach to understanding the globalized kind of world and practices of creativity, innovation, uh, but also noticed that something was getting lost there, you know, without like, not noticing what was happening on the ground. There was something totalizing and limiting about the planetary approach that was privileging a particular lineage of white male and European Marxist and neo-Marxist political economists at the expense of feminist, queer, and anti-colonial contributions to this sub-theory. And it also this kind of uh, from the top approach to understanding cities and their problems in a planetary way, uh, positions researchers as pre-constituted entities, not as living, breathing beings, who are not just doing, you know, of, of following messy pathways, but themselves are quite messy. So my loser images go beyond the perfect planetary vision of the drone eye, and also transcend the planetarity of much of contemporary theory, uh, which forgets often about partial views, um, Conceptually, Feminist with a Drone engages humor, irony, and partiality as a feminist method for conducting work in technoscience. This mode of effectively remodulating the traditional framework of what counts as knowledge and, and proper research opens up alternative ways of seeing and doing. Heather McLean recognizes that from a planetary standpoint, Artistic activities such as hers, she performs in a queer cabaret called uh, Fail Better, and projects such as mine with, you know, feminists with a drone, and not even a proper drone, you know, they could be positioned as ineffective. So people could say, you're not going to do a revolution with that, although, you know, hold this thought. But she also fears that through a lens preoccupied with mapping flows of capital, local sites of activism can end up looking weak and useless in the face of a steamroller-like neoliberal policy. And I share her concerns, but the accusation of weakness is itself a gendered strategy aimed at um, normalizing the militant and heroic of Victoria's ways of acting as knowledge producer, political actor, artist. Polish philosopher Eva Majewska has gone so far as to propose what she has termed the avant-garde of the weak, a mode of working which combines the feminist, re re 
rejections of patriarchal visions of genius and creativity, and emancipatory claims originating in the peripheries with the demand for an expanded epistemology, one including marginalized voices, colonized territories, and art history and practice. So my project, Feminist with a Drone, was designed as a performance of planetarity as a research problem, but also was trying to do kind of research designed as a performance. My goal was to perform the study of planetarity and the disciplines of art history, ethnography, geography, urban studies, architecture, design, uh, with their kind of colonial histories, epistemological exclusions, to do it differently. And even though the method and the tools I use, a toy drone, a beach ball, may seem naive and childlike, their underlying ambition to challenge our ongoing planetary foolishness as well as our partial vision are very serious indeed. So the Luther images figuration produced in the process follows in the footsteps of Peter Steyl, whose kin notion of poor images, which he recently extended to kind of mean images through AI, but we are sticking with poor images now. So um, uh, Steyl's poor images have become an important trope in contemporary critical studies of the image. Steyl uses the term to describe lossy digital images traversing the network personal computers of our globe. Their poverty refers to their low quality and low resolution as a result of their incessant replication on ever cheaper media. But also pointed to their uh, wider condition of cultural disjuncture with the impoverishment of many image producers and image the subject went hand in hand with the enrichment of those in control of digital infrastructures. Now, my Luther images are precisely such poor images of the world, um, serving as counterpoints to both space photography and those amazing drone views from Instagram and YouTube. They are a testament to the poor quality of the camera and the limited skills of the operator. I can finally tell you what you're going to see in here. So the first image in the top left-hand corner is mine, taken with my baby drone that I was losing and then it lost the way to live and then I lost it. So that's there. And then the other images, and the same happened in the previous screens uh, with my, my little drone, all the other images in those grids, they're kind of reminiscent to you, hopefully to you, of you know, uh, the Becker's typologies of architectures, except they look a bit sillier and messier, and you've got, again, more balls, footballs, beach balls. Uh, they were produced with the kind of same energy engine, which is an engine, uh, Google, you know, it's like Google search by image, but based more on look and mood. So I was trying and it has been trained on millions of images from Reddit, Instagram, Pinterest, to develop visual affinities with my own failed images. So I gave the, the search engine my own failed image and it gave me more failed images. And I kind of created these constellations and they are temporary. The next, you know, next gesture would be another constellation and another. You know, the gesture of making was more important than the stability of the grid that are produced. Um, I was just interested in also in the role of the artist in producing this kind of weakness, putting the weakness on the table as the gesture, but also kind of pointing to the weakness of the artifact. Um, in her article, Online Weak and Poor Images, uh, Czech writer Teresa Stejskalova has made an appeal to make use of online images in a way that presents a challenge to the mass image profit-driven network platform and to seek oppositional agency for images posted on social platforms. And so I'm so trying to kind of go a little bit beyond that kind of uh, elegance of kind of modernist grids to look at a different, create a different picture of the planet. Picking up a baton from style, I was speaking here in defense of the poor image of the world, low resolution, widely accessible, pirated, because you know, this is all a form of piracy. Now, it's still, I mean, it's still visible when it's done through search engines such as Google or that same energy that I use. When it's used for to train AI databases, suddenly becomes hidden. There's the same version of piracy, but I'm speaking here with what surmise is kind of putting these images on the table, so to speak, on the board, making these constellations of loser images. I'm speaking here for what we might term, with a nod to Gary Hall, an ethical piracy. 
In current philosophy, Hall revisits the Latin origins of the verb pirao, which means to make an attempt to try, test, endeavor, attack, to refer to the piratic practices in texts and images which go against the grain of traditional knowledge production, its classification and distribution. So Luther images are pirate images because they tease and give trouble. As per the word Greek etymology, Luther images also drop out of the competitive system of accolades, prizes, and telephones. They drop out of individual authorship, yet their marginal cultural status is not by itself a guarantee of progressivism. As recent years have aptly demonstrated, the right can meme and can use images very well indeed. So Luther images embrace their machinic heritage, but they also take on board the inevitable failures of human bodies and machinic infrastructures. As part of their feminist efficacy, they show up the dominant perception machine that we all inhabit as structurally and politically broken. Offering a fragile, tender look, loser images differ from ruined porn that we are treated to so often now in the age of the climate crisis, the aestheticization of loss, decay, and poverty. I'm sure you've all been to lots of exhibitions where artists like Rosa, you know, uh, delight in the collapse of the world. So they're trying to do something different. They restate planetarity as a call for help, enacting the collective exhaustion of humans, machines, and the environment. They lose their images are unproductive because they work against the logic of planetary extractivism, the depletion of natural and human resources, planetary management via technological involvement. So to speak in defense of the poor image of the world is to mobilize an ethical injunction to see the world better and to make better things in it. It's an injunction to look again anew around obliquely to respond to the limitations of the image and to know that the picture is always partial. You can call them outer space photographs with a difference. And this way of enacting, uh, seeing and, uh, and imaging is a form of exercising a minimal responsibility that we as artists and writers can take to enact a different relationship to our habitat. So it's kind of form of minimal ethics and minimal responsibility. So there is more where it came from. Again, in the in the Perception Machine book, so it's a free download, and the book has also a website with some visual projects, a couple of films, uh, and uh, this is it. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Joanna. Um, Maybe I'll start with the first question for you and then we can go around to see both for folks who are in the audience and online. I'm curious about, in based on your observation of this kind of vast perception machine as you describe it, that's kind of taking images from all over the planet, a lot of the images you showed um, had kind of a focused subject, right? Like there's like when in the kind of classic photography you think about like there's a subject of the image and then or and that subject is like often an object or something like this. And I'm thinking about the scope of planetary images that are taken from not only cameras from human beings that are uploaded to the internet, but all sorts of cameras that mm -hmm. are embedded in our environments. And I'm just curious in your observations if in looking at this vast array of images, there was also something that you noticed about the kind of shift in the groundwork or the focus of what these images conveyed, how the subject or the object in the image shifted as a result of this scope and scale. Yes, no, absolutely, absolutely. And also, it's not just about what images are there, but what images are presented for us to see. So it's not just a matter of avail availability, because as we know, and as Trevor Paglin has pointed it out, as Virilio before him, that the majority of images produced today are not made with a human viewer in mind. They are made to feed the kind of belly of the perception machine, you know, be it uh, kind of AI training databases, but also other things. But those that are presented for our view and the way the algorithm of that search engine, for example, that same uh, effect or what is it called? Uh, same energy is, is, is uh, uh, or the way kind of Google search by, search by image works 
is precisely through making kind of visual connections that make sense to humans. The same way like the, the, the digital image doesn't exist for humans. The human images always, you know, it has to be an analog. I teach a course called the digital image. But obviously we can't view digital images on the course on the digital image because for us to view them, they have to become analog. So in a way, there is also all sorts of stuff out there, but for things that become, come to our consciousness, and that presented to us and algorithmically as well and technically are those that we kind of notice. I'm always interested as well in the kind of what AI is doing. Sometimes there must be forms of communication between different systems. Maybe they are doing and producing other forms of meaning and other images that we don't recognize as images yet. So, great, thank you. Is there anybody here that wants to ask a question? Uh, maybe for a qu question. Um, in a way, was at one point you uh, you mentioned about that we as um, human bodies are basically um, feeding into this big system, so we are sort of paying, uh, doing work for the um, big tech companies. Um, do you could you elaborate on that a bit more? Because I was intrigued, but like where would that mm -hmm. go? Like how? Um, where would that go? <laughs> I mean, there's. There's obviously a lot of, of work on that in Christian media studies and sociology images that, uh, uh, well, where would that go? Would be to do less, <laughs> for example. That would be one way. Another one, kind of realizing about, you know, an average te teenager, and that's data from about a couple of years, an average teenager does two hours unpaid work for Zuckerberg every day. And again, that's changed, and I'm sure the companies have changed, and I think today's teenagers are probably working more for TikTok and other kind of Chinese companies because the platforms change. But it's just to, so first of all, it's not just a matter of consciousness raising, because I think the old Marxian uh, belief that you will reveal the conditions of injustice and people will know and stop doesn't work, because we've seen that with Snowden, we've seen that with Assange, I mean, they've told us things we know and we still do because it's not so easy to disconnect, it's not so easy partly because of all the you know, addiction, partly of labor dependencies and pre precarious dependencies. If you're a small business, you need some of this. But in terms of like our bodies, uh, how they are shaped with machines, at the moment, I'm interested in kind of figuring out how our bodies are also a function of machines, how we are a function of, and also of, of images, how images shape us in certain being, from the most banal and obvious sense of, you know, like Facetune and uh, certain Instagram aesthetic that you know creates our homes and views, but also even through kind of bodily movement, gestures, forms of perception, food. So the whole life becomes kind of curated, and the concept of curation, for better or worse, has traveled out. But in a way, you know, what it means to have your life so uh, algorithmized and modulated with a kind of certain forms of gestures and body body movement. So I think some of it is also, you know, where I'm kind of thinking here with Clusa, so it's not enough to just tell people because we know and yeah. we still do, but it's more about how can you enact certain, you know, spaces of freedom within the constraints of the perception machine. Because like there's no going, there's no switching off from social media as such, like to totally. Because even if you do, you will still be on it through other people, through institutions. Exactly. AI is not going anywhere, so yeah, yeah. no point just saying what's evil, let's just complain about it. No. Well, I think uh, that's why I find Flusser quite interesting because he's precisely recognizing, you know, that, you know, this idea of autonomy. I mean, maybe it was a certain liberal fantasy of a particular moment in time. Yeah. And uh, so even if we recognize the conditions of constraint, and some of them are technical through the apparatus of, you know, the system, society, uh, algorithmic kind of logic of the world. Some of them are bio and physiological and genetic. So, you know, there's a lot of debate in philosophy now whether there is such a thing of free will mm -hmm. and or there's just something that we feel there is free will. Yeah. And that's a very, it's actually an interesting debate, but I think it's framed and not in such an interesting way because in a way the sense of the sensation and the sense of that freedom is probably important yeah. in itself. So then I'm working with Flusser who's not having this kind of absolute idea of this kind of romantic notion of the free genius who liberates himself, usually would be a he, and runs away. It's much more working within the machine. So what do we do? How do, and you know, the interesting thing about humans that we are still quite glitchy ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like machine, um, uh, self-driving self cars. They would be amazing, except that humans didn't mess up. 
<laughs> and obviously I'm saying this ironically, because obviously humans will always do something unpredictable as in appear in front of that car. And that's why all the tests have failed so far, because humans will always human. And, and again, I'm not trying to position humans as this kind of special beings with these very different capacities from all other entities. I don't know, I mean, it's like, uh, longer term, you know, humans, as lots of other beings have become extinct, extinct, maybe human future is that. But for now, I am, of course, interested in creating and looking for these spaces of, you know, kind of glitches within the machine and the machine that also is partly, you know, either kind of holds us but also that works through us, embraces us. Hi, Joanna, I'll go to our online audience. Mm -hmm. um, Alexander Wormsley asks, several of the projects seem to aim to confront or to humanize AI and other non-human technologies. Do you consider your work with these technologies more as a confrontation or a collaboration? Um, I suppose more collaboration, to be honest, because confrontations, it would be, a, I mean, some of the work is critical, so I'm trying from within the machine to mobilize that kind of critical sensibility of trying to say something and to make an intervention, but I do absolutely recognize a collaboration. So I work within the philosophical tradition of what's known as originary technicity, coming from you know the kind of paleontological theory of the human having evolved with technology from you know, fire, stones, and used as weapons and as tools, through to you know, the wheel, uh, and then other simple machines, the internet. So there is, for me, there is always a collaboration, but there could, it could be more productive, this collaboration, it could be more damaging, it could be more precarious. So I'm interested in looking at what, how it can be enacted. But it's a, there is you know, a desire to find a certain opening certain forms of criticality within it, which is obviously a human desire with a particular historical tradition, but it is definitely premised on the recognition of technical, co not just collaboration, but also co-constitution of humans emerging with technology. Thank you. Any more from the room? All right, Joanna, thank you so much for your talk and presentation, and thanks for joining everyone this evening. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>